Miss Yarra the Bird. Yeah. Bobby, that's enough. Greetings, heathens. Welcome to this episode of Hail Satan. This is the podcast exploring Satanism, culture, and life in general through the eyes of modern Satanists. I'm going to be your host. My name is Joseph Rose. I'm a member of the Satanic Temple and founder of a group called Satanic Delco. We are located in southeastern Pennsylvania, so if you live in or around Delaware County, Pennsylvania, and you feel aligned with the Satanic Temple, by all means, come knock on our door. I think you'll find that we're a pretty welcoming bunch. Today on the show, we're going to be speaking with Joseph Laycock. He is the author of a book called Speak of the Devil, How the Satanic Temple is Changing the Way We Talk About Religion. If you're interested in reading a fairly exhaustive history of the Satanic Temple thus far, his book is definitely the one you want to check out. I'm here alone today doing all this, so I'm not going to waste your time with a bunch of chatter for me. I'm going to get on to our business. And the first piece of business is that we've been joined by a new patron this week, a Keisha W. I hope I'm saying that right. Keisha, thank you so much. I know I say it all the time, but I really, really appreciate the support that everyone has been giving me since starting this podcast. And in those moments where I am stressed the fuck out trying to get an episode together and make everything right for this thing, uh, I remember that so many of you send in these messages and support on Patreon and all of that, and you really do make it worth the effort. And I just thank you so much. All right. So I'm going to get into some listener mail right now. We've got a few got one from Trainer Derek. Hello, just wanted to reach out with some appreciation. I'm another new Satanist who had a click moment with the seven tenets and felt kind of locked in, so to say, after watching the Hail Satan documentary. I've been getting as active as I can in online groups and am awaiting approval for my local Friends of TST Facebook group. It feels like a good newbie-friendly intro, and I love the varied content, as well as the guests you've been able to feature. Love the show. Keep up the great work. Hail Satan. Thank you, Trainer Derek. I appreciate that very much. Uh, Next up, we've got Nelson. Hey, Joseph. Just wanted to say I've been listening since the first episode, and this is one of my favorite podcasts. Interesting discussions, various viewpoints, very informative. I have a similar story to a lot of people who shared their past with you. Raised in a strict Southern Baptist sect until about 15, when I started asking a lot of philosophical questions and poking holes in their beliefs purely out of genuine curiosity. I was atheist for years and longing for the sense of community that comes with religion. I knew the Church of Satan but didn't subscribe to their might-is-right beliefs and discovered the Satanic Temple and the Seven Tenets earlier this year. I found out my manager at work was a member, and ever since I've just been looking for more and more info, your podcast has helped a lot. Thank you, Hail Satan. Thank you, Nelson. I am really glad you're getting something out of the show. Thanks for dropping a line. And last, we've got one from Ian. Hello there, Mr. Rose. Very formal. Thank you for your work on the show. My journey with Satanism began a little over a year ago after seeing the band Twin Temple open at a live show. Immediately after their set, I began researching and found out about the Satanic Temple. I hadn't actually become a member of TST until this past April, shortly after quarantine began, and as someone who had been struggling with mental health and isolation even before the pandemic, finding and following the seven tenets has greatly improved my outlook on life. I'm still not where I'd like to be, but finding faith, or technically a lack thereof, has helped me feel like a better person and change my way of life. Your podcast is the perfect accoutrement to my, you notice how I said that? Accoutrement. (laughs) To my overall faith in that it allows me a space every week to feel a little closer to my satanic lifestyle. Thank you, Joseph. Hail Satan, hail thyself, and happy Sol Invictus if you celebrate. Thank you, Ian. I appreciate it very much. I appreciate everyone's messages. Keep them coming. That reminds me, take a moment if you can, please. Stop by HailSatanPodcast.com. 
on our website. You'll find links to our social media accounts. You can keep up on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. I'm mostly active on Instagram, I guess, but I do a little bit on all of them, and I am trying to get a little more active. So by all means, hit us up. You also have a form on the website to send us an email. I would love it if you'd send an email and give some feedback on the show. Also, feel free to share your stories, uh, any of your stories that you'd like to, I guess, related to your journey through Satanism. And of course, there's a link on the website to sign up for our Patreon account where you can directly support the show and you'll get some bonus content over there, some discounts on things. And uh, I am going to do some work coming up pretty soon to enhance and maybe revamp the Patreon a little bit, change some things around to make it a little better for everyone. So feel free to do that if you'd like. The website is HailSatanPodcast.com. All right, everyone. My guest today is an assistant professor of religious studies at Texas State University and the author of Speak of the Devil, which is the definitive history of the Satanic Temple thus far, Mr. Joseph Laycock. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Just to get a little bit of background, what role did religion play during your early life? Well, I'm Catholic, um, and I did did the whole thing. <laughs> um, you know, I was raised Catholic. I was an altar server. I was confirmed. Uh, I was married uh, in the Catholic Church. Uh, and I still consider myself uh, Catholic, although when I tell people I'm Catholic, everyone has an entire set of assumptions uh, about what that means, and they're, they're usually wrong. So that's, that's kind of my background in a nutshell. What do you remember being your first contact with the idea of Satanism generally? And, you know, what was your impression of it at the time? Well, I grew up in the 1980s uh, during the Satanic Panic. So, you know, I learned about Satanism very early on because I was told that everything around me was satanic, right? right. Um, I wrote a separate book about Dungeons and Dragons, and I was told that Dungeons and Dragons is, is satanic. Um, not so much by my family or my church, but like my dentist or teachers or just anybody that I met growing up in, in Central Texas uh, would, would give me that message. I also remember uh, being in grade school uh, when a UT student named Mark Kilroy was killed in Matamoros, Mexico, and the media that he had been killed uh, by, by Satanists who were also uh, uh, drug dealers. Uh, and, and so, yeah, I think from, from the early 80s, I had an idea that there was such a thing as Satanism. Um, and I probably didn't know more about what actual religious Satanism was, maybe till college. Are you about in your 40s now? I am 40 years old. Yeah, I'm 42, and I definitely remember as a kid getting bits of that satanic panic stuff, definitely as it pertained to things like Dungeons and & Dragons and rock and heavy metal music at the time. Even at a pretty young age, I was somewhat aware of that stuff, seeing it on TV and all. Um, I mean, even things like, you know, the, the Care Bears or these, these totally innocuous, you know, <laughs> capitalist crap that was going on in the 80s was framed as being some kind of insidious – uh, a, a satanic uh, a brainwashing of children. Since you're you're obviously deep into religious studies, I'm just curious if you know of the earliest documented use of the term satanic or satanist, satanism, any of that. Uh, there was a recent book on the history of satanism called Children of Lucifer, which is a really good academic uh, book. And that book uh, dates the term back to uh, the 1500s, which was the aftermath of the Protestant Reformation. Mm. So, you know, for a thousand years or so in, in Europe, you had basically just one church uh, and there really weren't any other, you know, legal religious options. And then it's when you suddenly get, there's two kinds of Christians now, there's Catholics and Protestants and you have wars of religion. That's when this term Satanism appears, right? So it's, you guys aren't real Christians, you're Satanists. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, no, you're Satanists, right? So it was a slur uh, long before anyone actually identified as a, as a Satanist. Right. It was sort of a black or white issue. You're either on the right side of this, our side, or you're a Satanist. Right. And it's really a form of, I think, intellectual laziness, right? Yeah. It's 
I mean, people are going to get bored if you start saying, well, we interpret this Bible passage this way, but you guys interpret it that way. And this is why we think we're, it's much more effective to just scream Satanist at someone who disagrees with you. Uh, because ultimately, by, by modern standards, the difference between, say, the Catholic Church and the Church of England, as religions go, are, are not that big, right, compared to some of the religions that, that interact with each other today in, in the 21st century. Yeah. How did the idea of writing a book about the Satanic Temple first become a real priority for you? I first learned about the Satanic Temple when they reached out to the state of Oklahoma. And so we would like to build this Baphomet uh, monument to go with the the Ten Commandments uh, monument at, at your capital. And I write for an online magazine called Religion Dispatches, and I, I reached out to Lucian Greaves, and I, uh, I had an interview with, with him. And Religion Dispatches, which is a progressive-leaning news outlet, loved the Satanic Temple, and they were interested in sort of everything that they did. And so I did, I did a number of stories just kind of tracking each new provocation the Satanic Temple did. And eventually I decided there was enough here to do a book, and I wanted to do a book for a couple of reasons – one of which was I, I felt that everybody knew about the Satanic Temple, but they only knew what was getting reported in the media. Uh, and so everyone just had this assumption that this was just this big, elaborate trolling project, mm. which if you actually meet members of the Satanic Temple, it really isn't. Right? If you actually uh, attend one of their meetings or watch them socialize together, it, it, when, when Christians do those things, they call it fellowship. right? But that's what they're doing. It's not a... It's not all a, a trolling operation or something like that. Uh, I also wanted to create a history uh, of this movement uh, because I think there was a lot of confusion about how it began and, and what it's sort of evolved into. And then the third reason is I think the Satanic Temple is really important, not necessarily because they're Satanists or anything to do with Satanism, but because they are forcing a public conversation about what is religion, uh, that I think Americans are very reluctant to have that conversation, and they won't do it unless you're, you're doing something like trying to bring a satanic after-school program into public schools, right? And then they finally will confront this issue of what do we mean when we say something is a religion or it isn't, or when we say we believe in, in religious freedom. And so that, to me, is the most interesting thing about this group, and that's why uh, the book has the title that it does. When you, you know, you were obviously in contact with the leadership of TST starting the book, were they completely open and cooperative right off the bat? Well, I'm, I think they were more open than I expected them to be. You know, I've, I've written several books on religious subcultures, all of which uh, have a reason to fear the media and a reason to fear academics, because sometimes there have been academics who have just gone in and totally slandered a, a group in, in their publications. However, the, the Satanic Temple was surprisingly, I think, the most open. Uh, at the same time, uh, they, have, they have liabilities that they are concerned about. You know, while I was researching this book, uh, somebody physically attacked the Satanic Temple uh, headquarters in, in Salem. You know, and these people have families and children and things like that. Um, so I, I was very careful. And, and when I was getting ready to send the book Uh, off to the publisher, I followed up with all of my interview contacts. And I said, you know, this is the quote that I'm I'm running from you, you know, let me know if that's okay. And then also let me know that your pseudonym is okay, because some people didn't want to use a pseudonym, but most of them did. And some of them were sort of still refining their pseudonyms. So I would keep getting these emails saying, Uh, you know, I've I've changed my name. Now it's, you know, Dagon, you know, antithesis or or whatever. (laughs) Right. Um, And I would, I would try to keep that, that updated. um, But I really didn't want to create a situation where someone could, you know, put the clues together about somebody's life and then out them as a Satanist and then cause consequences for their, their family. I didn't want that on my conscience, but mostly uh, my, my research informants were able to kind of um, work with me and create a kind of alliance where, you know, ideally I want all of my research to be a win-win, right? I want to, um, you know, I, I want to accomplish my goals as a researcher, as an academic, but I also would like it to be a chance for these communities to be better understood uh, by, by my readers. So that's, that's the goal. Was there much of anything that was sort of off limits or anything that they objected to generally? Sure. I mean, there were lots of things because the Santa Temple is engaged in all these lawsuits. Mm. There were plenty of things where they said, you know, we are under a gag order. Right. <laughs> right? Or, you know, they, uh, there were even cases where they said, you know, 
um, you're not supposed to know this and, you know, you, you really can't publish this in, in your book. And I, I'm talking about things like um, it's a satanic temple, you know, uh, uh, sues like when, when they sued uh, uh, Netflix, for example. Right. right? Um, but if you sue a company like that, um, usually part of any agreement is they say you can't you can't talk about this. So definitely things like that. Um, that they were not supposed to tell me. And, and if I did find out about them sort of just by hanging out <laughs> or something like that, um, you know, they, they would remind me, you know, don't, don't talk about that. And, and there was never anything that I felt was important to the book um, that, that had to be left out. You know, the, the issues that um, kind of have the most legal implications and things like that are also the most sort of banal details. Like right. if, if I had learned that, you know, they were smuggling heroin or something <laughs> like that, I would have put that in the book, but, but nothing exciting like that ever, ever came up. Sure. And, and right off the bat, you made it clear, you do not identify as a Satanist, if anything, maybe fairly opposite the idea of a Satanist. Yeah. I mean, I, again, I don't think there's anything wrong with being a Satanist. Sure. Right. Sure. Um, so, so I, when I say I'm not a Satanist, I don't, I don't mean to imply that there's, there's something wrong with that. I've met lots of really wonderful Satanists doing this, this research. At the same time, I am annoyed when people just assume that because I can research a group and not totally trash it, that I must be a Satanist myself. Right. Yeah. Um, as, as you know, I, I really, I really do hope to see kind of more uh, dialogue between people of kind of traditional theistic religions uh, and, and groups like the Satanic Temple. And I talk about that a little bit in the book. Uh, I was very impressed by uh, Father Francis X. Clooney at Harvard, who was a Jesuit, who at least reached out to the Satanic Temple when they tried to do a black mass at Harvard. Yes. And at least sent them an email saying, you know, what, what is a black, what are we guys going to do exactly? <laughs> right. Um, because the, the overwhelming majority of, of Catholics who came to protest that event, not only had no idea what was going on, but were pointedly uninterested in knowing what was going on. Yeah. Right. And I really uh, find that behavior um, rather shameful. Right. So I was inspired by people like Francis X. Clooney, who, uh, at least have the intellectual curiosity to try to figure out what's what's going on. I, I would like to see more of that, um, as because I think these dialogues between Christians and Satanists, it's like there's going to be less of them in the future, right? I think there's going to be more, so we might as well start modeling that dialogue now. Having researched and written the book, you're probably as familiar as anyone out there with the ideology of the Satanic Temple and certainly the seven tenets. Is there anything in there that you personally can't align yourself with, or you feel like, well, maybe I, I don't quite agree with that one, or I don't really, I'm not feeling that one. No, I don't think so. Yeah, I, I don't think so. And I think what most inspires me, especially talking about the seven tenets with Lucian Graves and Malcolm Jerry is especially Malcolm Jerry's philosophy of justice mm. Uh, because a lot of people look at the Satanic Temple and they say, well, you guys don't believe in anything supernatural, so you're not a real religion. And that's a separate conversation of do you have to believe in something supernatural to, to be a real religion. But, you know, justice is not a something that you can study scientifically. Right? It's not like hydrogen or something like this. And Malcolm Jerry said, well, to me, justice is something that will never actually exist in the world. It's a it's a transcendent ideal that we keep moving closer to, but we never fully reach. And so to me, that, that attitude of, of justice as being something that um, in, in some ways is, tr is truly like a matter of faith, right? Um, be because I don't think Malcolm Jerry could say, well, here's rationally why we should have a just society. He just believes we should have a just society, right? That's what TST believes in. They just sort of accept that as, as self-evident. Yeah. Um, so having that conversation um, kind of made me respect the Satanic Temple even more um, as, as a group that does actually believe in something, even if it's not sort of supernatural in the way that we usually talk about that term. It is something transcendent. Um, and that's a concept that I see in, in most traditions that we recognize as, as religions. Yeah, maybe you would agree. There's enough leeway or, or vagueness left in the seven tenets where there is room for interpretation there 
uh, I imagine that was done intentionally, room for those things to grow and change and allow for some debate within the the world. Right. And, and that's one thing that I, that I noticed actually doing field work with the Satanic Temple is they would sit around and they would debate the tenants, right? And especially cases where the tenants seem to contradict each other, right? So if you have freedom to offend, which is one of the tenants, mm -hmm. but you also want to treat people with compassion, right? I mean, there's a potential contradiction in there, right? So you have to uh, adjudicate that. Um, and it was, and this is true of all religions, right? All religion, every time you have any kind of code, there has to be interpretation of, of what the code means. Um, but what it did show is the seven tenets is a real religious code that people are trying to live by. It is not something that was just made up to have a crafty lawsuit, right? Yeah. Which is how a lot of opponents of TST, uh, that that's how they assume that this was all, uh, that's what this is. Sure. One criticism that people have made toward the Satanic Temple is that they're a political activist group rather than a true religion. Based on what you feel defines a religion, do you think the Satanic Temple should qualify? Absolutely. You know, and I talk about that in, in the book. I mean, so, so first of all, the critique that well, you guys can't be a real religion because you're political uh, is, to, to me, patently absurd. Yeah. Right. Show me any religious group that's not political. <laughs> right. Sure. Um, the, the religion is the most powerful political force in the country right now. So, so to say that that um, they can't be a religion because they're political is like saying, well, this can't be water because it's wet mm. or something like this. Right. Um, that that's absurd. Um, I, I think the, the, the you know, so, so religion is a second order category. And what I mean by that is, it's a, it's a category of things. It's not a thing unto itself. And it's a category that was made up by Europeans um, in about uh, the, the 16th century, right? After the, the wars of religion. And af at the same time that Europeans are going and they're discovering the cultures of Asia and Africa and the Americas and so forth. So they say there's certain things that we're going to categorize as, as religion. So like Columbus famously wrote back to Spain and said, you know, the people in this new land, they don't have any religion. Well, now most days would say, well, of course, you know, native people of America do have religion. It's just that Columbus didn't recognize it as, as, as such. So it's a category of things. And, you know, we, I think it's very hard to get people to think consistently about how they are defining that category and whether something ought to go into it. So if you're saying I define religion as you have to believe in God, um, and then you want to say this tank temple isn't therefore a religion. Well, then at least you're being consistent. At least you're being honest about what you're doing. Right, right. now, the Supreme Court doesn't have an official definition of religion, but they have said you don't have to believe in God to to be a real religion. There's there's uh, several important Supreme Court cases where where they said that. So you know, I think you need to have a sensible idea of what should what you want to count as as a religion. Um, and uh, lately in religious studies, this, this sort of game of, you know, what, ac what actually is it that makes something a religion as opposed to, I don't know, a philosophy or something else, um, has been uh, what's been described as a, a family resemblance approach. Hmm. So, so it's a little bit like, um, you know, the old Jeff Foxworthy sketch, right? You might be a redneck. <laughs> right. Right. But, <laughs> you know, if you have some of these things, you, you might be a, a religion. Um, and so the model that I use in the, in the book to talk about sort of how TST could qualify as a religion uh, is called the four C's. And the argument is basically, if you have these four things, you can reasonably be called a religion. And those are community, code, uh, which is sort of um, ideas of how you're supposed to act, which you find the seven tenets. Creed, which is things that they believe in, which is also um, found in the seven tenets. And then cultus, which is ritual. And the TST, TST does get together and they perform rituals, not just to, you know, annoy people or create media spectacles, but for their own purposes. Um, so they, it has the four C's. So I think that's as reasonable um, a way to, to qualify as a religion as, as, as any other. Yeah, I found that, you know, on the ground level with individuals, it seems like they have a definition of well, it kind of mirrors their own religion. They say, well, in their mind, it's my religion looks like this, and the satanic temple doesn't have what my religion has, so 
it's not a religion. <laughs> and I, I think there's a lot of that, just sort of looking at it from a very personalized view. Right. And, and this is what I want people to understand, is that the way that people in our society define what is or what isn't a religion is almost always an exercise in political power. Yeah. Right. So, of course, you want religious freedom for everybody if your worldview is the only thing that counts as a religion. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and, and so then it really is just religious privilege. It's not religious freedom. And what's so interesting about this Tang Temple is they're sort of forcing people to admit things that they have always believed but didn't really want to admit. So a very common thing that I saw in response to this Tang Temple is, well, the Constitution only means when it says freedom of religion, it only means good religions. It doesn't mean evil religions. Right. Right. Uh, well, actually, you know, some of the founding fathers probably would consider some of these modern churches to be evil. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, certainly someone like Thomas Paine uh, would, would consider the people making these arguments to be morally uh, uh, evil. Um, and, you know, there was this uh, uh Edit, a letter to the editor in the, the Harvard Crimson by a Harvard student basically saying religious freedom is bad. If, mm. these, if this means Satanists can practice their religion, uh, then, it, then it's bad, and I don't believe in religious freedom anymore. And this was coming from a Catholic student, and of course Catholics were not welcome in America for a very long time. It was only because of the concept that people should have freedom to practice their religion that Catholics were able to get a foothold in cities like Boston. Yeah. So I, so, so I really see this as a case of a, a, a religious group that came to America and then it's sort of pulling the ladder up behind them, right? If, if we got our privilege, now let's, now let's shut the, the gates. In a, in a case like that, where a group, in this case, some Catholics were, you know, having this knee jerk reaction to the satanic temple, is that simply a matter of the standard Christian view of Satan, the Christian tale of Satan, or is that also all of the baggage that comes from that satanic panic of the 80s and 90s, and that is just still the definition that most people have in their mind of what Satanism is? I think it's important to remember that Catholic culture is uniquely preoccupied with the idea of Satanism and black masses, right? Um, the idea that uh, Satanists desecrate um, the host in black masses begins around the same time that the church officially uh, promulgates the doctrine of transubstantiation, right? So, so for, for Protestants, when they have communion, it's symbolic. But when Catholics have communion, they say this is literally the body and blood of, of Christ. You are literally eating Christ's body and blood. And so the rumors of satanic masses kind of went with that because they're saying, well, why else would the Satanists be trying to steal this unless we're right and the Protestants are wrong and this is truly uh, the body of Christ? So, you know, I, I teach a class on new religious movements and I do a unit on Satanism because the students are so interested in it. And I have had Catholic students say, you know, this literally makes me feel sick to my stomach to, to, dis to even discuss Satanism. Mm. Um, and, and so I understand that that's sort of where they're, they're coming from. And this is older than uh, the satanic panic of the eighties. So if you read like the novel, the exorcist, for example, there are black masses being uh, going on in, in the background in, in, in that novel. So it's a very old idea at the same time. I can't help but feel that um, a lot of Catholics in Boston were not, although they claimed to be horrified by a black mass, they were actually excited about it. Right. You know, they're actually like, finally, we can prove that that we really are persecuted in this way that we've all, always claimed. And I found a blog post by a Catholic priests in Boston saying things like, you know, I'm so happy that this happened because the slumbering Goliath of American Catholicism has awoken. You know, I was really struck by that phrase. Like, okay, first of all, if you know your Bible, Goliath's not a good guy. Right. <laughs> right. Goliath isn't someone to, to emulate, but it just seemed like it was sort of celebrating. Like we have this power to mobilize 2000 people to shut someone up if they say something that, that offends us. Um, you know, that, that should never be something to be celebrated. It, at best, that should be sort of, it's really too bad that it was necessary to, to, to do this. Um, so, so although I, I feel like a lot of Catholics are legitimately deeply terrified of Satanism, 
Um, I was very disappointed by by what played out in in Boston because I really do feel like it, it was just sort of bullying and really turning this very small group of people into this foil to um, advance their own kind of uh, agenda. Yeah, I guess on a human level, so many of us love a little bit of drama thrown in there, and a fight's not as much fun without an opponent. So that that gave them an opportunity. Well, and, and again, they, they kept saying things like, you know, in a black mass, you kill babies, mm. right? So they never quite crossed the line into saying they will kill a baby at Harvard in front of everyone, but they heavily implied that, yeah. right? So, so they were actually, they were saying this is this, this horrible atrocity that the Satanists are doing, but they were consciously doing as much as they could to build it up into an even bigger atrocity in everyone's imagination. Uh, and so I find that uh, very problematic and um, dishonest. Yeah. In the book, you have a chapter called Satanic Schisms. And in that one, you write about attorney Mark Rendaza signing on to represent the Satanic Temple and in turn some of the various controversy that came from that. What's your personal opinion on that situation? Do you feel like there is any conflict between the ideals of the Satanic Temple and using an attorney that has represented Alex Jones and neo-Nazis and other controversial clients? So it's funny. I was in Salem the day that Lucian Greaves and some others went to go see Mark Randazza for the first time. And the, the camera crew was also there because they were filming the documentary, Hail Satan. Mm -hmm. And they were saying, you know, we're going to go meet with his lawyer. Joe, do you want to come? And I said, yeah, that sounds interesting. I'd like to witness that. And then the documentary crew said, well, there's not really any room in the van because we've got you know, <laughs> all these productions. So I didn't get to go. Mm. Um, it would have been interesting if I had. So I never got to meet Mark Randaza. I do remember that day that, that Lucian was complaining or there was the disagreement about how exactly it ended up working with, with Mark Randaza. Because I think Lucian's version of the story, and, and he, may, he, he may not stick to this. He may have a, a different version of it. But he, he, I remember him saying, basically, Randaza came to us, right? Randaza came to us and offered his services for free. Right. Um, and Randaza told um, Hail Satan, of course, all of this was dropped from the documentary, but he told the Hail Satan documentary, you know, when my secretary called me and said the satanic temple's on the phone and they want to hire you, you know, I, I jumped at the chance or something. And, you know, Lucian Greaves was complaining about this. He said, well, we didn't offer to hire you. You're working for free. Right? And, and you came to us. We, we didn't come to you. Um, so the overall impression that I got was that sort of Randaza was in this kind of to raise his profile or that maybe he just likes being controversial or having people write about him or something like that. Yeah. Um, Lucian Greaves was pretty, seemed pretty honest that he said, you know, he has bad clients and he may even be a bad guy, but we need a lawyer and, and he's free and sort of foul water will put out a fire as, as well as fair water. But uh, a, a lot of the people who left this tank temple who I interviewed obviously didn't see it that way. Uh, and, and more so for them, I think they felt that working with Rendaza and especially working with Rendaza kind of unilaterally without consulting, um, you know, widely amongst the, the overall organization was kind of the last straw. Right. And so I kept hearing this language of, well, it's not a good look. Right. Or it's not not good optics to 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 work with somebody uh, like this. So I, I do think that reports about that schism in 2018 by groups like Jezebel um, or there's even a recent book called uh, Sacred Rights that talks about that that breakup. Uh, it, it's not like had it not been for working with Rendaza, this wouldn't have happened. You know, <laughs> I talk about that with the book. I think I think these other groups splintering off from TST was probably inevitable. And that was just sort of the, the straw that broke the camel's back. And the choice to work with Rendaza was based on the fact that he was offering the work pro bono. Yeah. That's another thing people I think don't understand is this tank temple is totally broke all the time. <laughs> like it's not like they have any, any money, right. Um, they're, they're not only broke, they're, they're in debt. Right. Um, and I think my suspicion, I've never looked at their finances or anything, but my suspicion is that, there are a few people in the Satanic Temple who come from money and can kind of, um, you know, pick up the, the bill for things like making a gigantic bronze monument. Right. Um, so, so I know, for example, that Malcolm Jerry had to put up a lot of the money out of his own pocket for that monument. 
uh, stuff could be some money was crowdsourced, but not nearly enough to, to build something like that. And these legal fees, you know, for these court cases, uh, especially like the court case over uh, abortion in Missouri, it was like three hundred thousand dollars or something like wow. this. And I, so I don't know really if it was, broke. <laughs> I'm not sure if it was in the film or or somewhere else, but I think I remember hearing Lucian mention that that Baphomet monument, the statue cost them maybe a hundred thousand dollars. That's that's right. Because you think about the sculptor himself, I forget the name of the sculptor, but it basically it was all he did for a year was yeah. work on this. And then they had to go to Florida to get the mold cast and everything. So yeah, it was an incredibly expensive uh, uh, undertaking. And, and I talked to, um, one of the, the people who was involved in TST at the very beginning. And, you know, they looked at kind of cheaper options. Like there was one guy who said, well, I have this basically spray on concrete that can make you a pretty cool looking, you know, concrete statue with that. And they really said, no, we want to, we want to go bigger or go home. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but I think that because they can do something like that, people just assume, you know, TST is like Coca-Cola or Microsoft and they have all this money and they can do whatever they want. And of course, that's nothing could be further from the truth. Right. In that same chapter, you wrote former TST member Jex Blackmore reported experiencing harassment and abuse while in TST and implied there is corruption in TST's fundraising. There have been similar claims from several members who have left the Satanic Temple. Was there ever any attempt made to investigate or follow up in some way on any of those type of claims for the book? Yeah. I mean, all I can say about that, um, you know, first of all, I, I think when I was re- getting ready to write this book, some people thought I was like Robert Mueller or something. And, you know, <laughs> it was like, once, once this book comes out, everybody will know about the corruption. Right. Um, those accusations went both ways. Sure. Right. So all these groups that broke off TST said, well, they stole, you know, there are all these funds that that chapter had and they just disappeared when this group broke away. We never got a straight answer. And then, you know, there would be similar accusations going the other way. And I, I don't have the knowledge, the the inclination or the resources to actually investigate any of this. I mean, I can't subpoena people or anything right. like, like that. Um, so all I could do is just kind of be true to the sentiment that I was getting from my interviewees, which was, you know, I, I really feel wrong. I really feel um, uh, upset. And, you know, I, I don't doubt that. I'm, I'm sure that they really did feel wronged. Um, but again, that, that was on both sides, um, sure. which is, is not, again, not so surprising in the larger context of religious schisms, right? Religious schisms are normal. Um, we know sociologically that if you have a movement that's worth anything, that this, this, this kinds of uh, splintering is, is going to happen. So through your time researching and and working with the Satanic Temple on the book, did you have any opinions or views of the group generally that changed from, you know, your initial impression or did it just sort of reinforce what you thought they were? I think that, yeah, I mean, going out and doing, um, you know, I I call it field work, but going and just sort of hang out and observing at TST meetings. Um, I was surprised by how big it was, you know, I I think a lot. So for example, the TST Austin chapter, I live in Austin, uh, was over a hundred people, you know, while I was doing this, this, this research. And I think there is still a wide perception that TST is sort of like oceans 11 or something. It's, you know, this handful of really talented people, but it's not a real movement. And of course it is a real movement. Um, you know, these chapters are pretty good sized chapters. I was also surprised by, the diversity that I saw. So there were some surveys of uh, online surveys of Satanists in the early 2000s. And those found that most self-identified Satanists are white males. Mm -hmm. So I was surprised, especially here in central Texas by um, how many Latinx people um, were, were in TST um, by how many queer or LGBT people uh, uh, were in TST. And these were kind of things that I had heard about, but until you kind of see it firsthand, um, you, you don't really get a sense of it. So in a lot of ways, the demographics of TST really did go against the conventional wisdom about religious Satanism. This this didn't look anything like previous academic scholarship that I had read on, you know, what, what Satanists look like or how many of them there are. Yeah. And does that 
is that maybe unique to the idea of Satanism being so attractive to what I usually refer to as the outsider, generally, just people that have had a history of not necessarily fitting into a very common, specific thing and looking for the like-minded? Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. You know, I, I talk about this in the final chapter of the book. I think there is a precedent for you know, you know, people who are sort of on the losing end of American history to have sympathy for the devil. So the two um, examples that I use are um, an, an account of uh, Prince Hatui in, uh, in Cuba, uh, who has only just learned about Christianity and says, well, I hope I go to hell because at least there won't be any Spanish there <laughs> right, as they're executing him. Um, and, and then a possibly apocryphal story of uh, an enslaved black a uh, conjure man who prays to Satan because he says the white, the, the, the white people don't fear God, but they fear Satan. Mm. Um, now that could be a true story or, or it could be made up, but it dates back to the, the, the late uh, 1800s. So I think there has always been um, that kind of sympathy, but I think um, for most of the short history of religious Satanism, um, religious Satanism was mostly something that kind of, uh, Anton LaVey and sort of upper class uh, white people in San Francisco were, were involved in, right? With exceptions like Sammy Davis Jr., right? right who was a member of, of the Church of Satan. Um, so I think that um, uh, more and more minority people are becoming interested in Satanism. I would love to be involved in a separate project on um, black Satanists um, because I did meet a handful of black Satanists doing this research and it was very interesting. Um, and I actually was recently approached by a colleague who uh, has an undergraduate student who is an African-American Satanist and wants to do a project on this. And of course, there's just not much research out there yet. It's a gap uh, in the research. But I did get to interview um, Steve Hill, uh, who was involved with the, the TST chapter in Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah, I did an course, episode with Steve Hill on that topic exactly. Where are all the black Satanists? <laughs> And and I think, right. So, I mean, one of the things that Steve Hill said is that, um, you know, black people are a lot less scary if they are quote unquote church folk. Right. And so if there are black celebrities or athletes or comedians who are openly atheists or or just not Christian, um, they tend to get denied a platform. Um, But he also said, you know, I, I don't like combat boots and black lipstick. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, so the aesthetics of Satanism would, I think have to change somewhat as it becomes more, more diverse. And I, I did see conversations about that, especially with some of the groups who left TST of if we're going to form a new satanic organization, what do we want it to look like visually? Yeah. I think that is a really important part of it. All of the other cultural things that come along with the idea of Satanism, whether that idea is you know, based on much reality or not, that is the way it is. So if you had to predict, where do you see all this going? Does TST's brand of Satanism reach the mainstream in a noteworthy way? And do the legal battles mean anything significant for the future of the country? So I I think, I think the legal battles are the most interesting thing, not because TST is necessarily going to win, although they, they have had some, some small victories here and there. Um, but I mean, the nice thing about taking somebody to court is, you know, a, a judge has to not just say you win or you lose, but here's why I cited the way that I did. So they are forced to write a written defense of, of their arguments. And once something is written down, then you can actually, you can actually talk about it, right? Um, what, what annoys me so much about the way religion gets used in our discourse is um, everyone has a, a secret definition of religion in their head that they never openly talk about, right? Right. So, so the more TST drags people to court, the more they force these kinds of assumptions out of the open and people actually begin saying things like, I don't believe in religious freedom, or I believe in religious freedom for religions that I don't consider to be evil. Right. And then we can talk about, well, is that does that actually make sense? Is that actually what we want religious freedom to to mean? Um, because that's how it's 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 been operating for, for a long time. So I think their their main influence is changing a discourse. I think a strong example of that is in Oklahoma, you know, it was actually a Baptist pastor who sued Oklahoma and said this is a violation of the state constitution to put a Ten Commandments monument up. 
Uh, and it was based on that lawsuit that it was taken down by the Oklahoma Supreme Court. TST didn't really have anything to do with it, except that in the immediate aftermath, there was a movement to just rewrite the Oklahoma Constitution and say that you can put religious symbols on public property. Right. But in the discussion of that, they said, well, wait a second. What about those Satanist guys? Yeah. <laughs> if we rewrite the Oklahoma Constitution, won't the Satanists come back? Um, so I think there are cases like that where even even if TST doesn't have any kind of direct influence on the court, it kind of changes the political calculus uh, around these, these issues. Um, I don't know if in 50 years TST will still exist. Um, you know, there's a, there's a Facebook group called Raising Hell about, you know, uh, TST members who have children and sort of how they're kind of trying to pass their values on onto their children. Mm. But I do think that we are seeing a style, a new style of sort of socially engaged Satanism or left-hand path spirituality that I think is going to exist in one form or another for, for a long time. Well, Joe, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this with me today. Is there anything that you'd like to talk about that you're, you're working on currently or let everyone know where they can find you and keep up with you? Sure. Um, the easiest way to find me is just, just Google my name. There's, there's not a whole lot of Joseph Laycox in the world. Um, that'll take you to a, just a Google site where I keep uh, links to all my, my, my publications and, and articles uh, and such. Um, you can get Speak of the Devil uh, on, on Amazon. And then my newest book is called The Penguin Book of Exorcisms, um, which you can actually get anywhere. That's, that's uh, paperback and, and that's in bookstores. So if you like demons and the macabre um or screaming church authorities uh that that could be a fun read as well i feel like maybe some of our listeners will be interested in such a thing (laughs) excellent i hope they are great thanks again joe i really appreciate your time yeah it's a pleasure to be here take it easy all right all right everybody there you have it i hope you enjoyed my little conversation with joe laycock that was nice of him to offer up his time If you have a moment, please stop by HailSatanPodcast.com. You can sign up for our mailing list, our social media, our Patreon, all of that type of stuff. Let me just say Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Sol Invictus, whatever else you might be into. Go do it the best you can. Until next time. Shipping in the evil free service,